and it's tagged with a long right to the chin by Durrell. Anthony backs across the ring with the round almost over and takes a hard left hook to the chin by Durrell, who misses the right, and then brings in another left, and another left hook to the jaw, a right to the jaw by Durrell, and Anthony knows he's in a fight here, and there's the bell. Well, I'm getting old, but I'm not old yet. I'm already worried that I might forget how to laugh, how to love, how to live, how to learn. I want to die with a smile when it comes my turn. Thirty-five years ago, this was Yvonne Durrell's Fisherman's Club. Yvonne Durrell became a professional boxer in 1948. By 58, he was the second ranked light heavyweight in the world. His championship bout with Archie Moore is considered one of the 10 best fights of the 20th century. The legend of the fighting fisherman was born. Seven, eight. Since we're in Yvonne's hometown, we've asked a few friends and family to join us and share some of their memories about the fighting fisherman. Hello? Good. Anyone here know Yvonne Durrell? Yeah. All right. That's good. Let's talk. <laughs> Who here can tell us about Yvonne Durrell, the fighter? Yvonne was born a boxer. Yvonne relied a lot on natural ability, and he had a hell of a lot of natural ability. I mean, yeah. to have the gumption, the guts to have such a, an amazing dream, and it came true. This is where the greatness is. I think he was a real life. Rocky. And we have about two minutes to go in this round as Durrell comes in with a hard left hook to the chin. The left. Established um, to our uh, archives, newspaper archives, that he had 100, 113 fights. He won 87, 48 by a knockout. He, he lost 23 fights. In the ring, he was the most fierce old guy that you ever met. Yeah. And, and out of the ring, what a yeah. wimp. Yeah, my first lesson to boxing from dad was to duck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he said, you gotta, you gotta go like this, and he says, when I say duck, he says, you got a duck under the punch. That's a duck. Next thing I look, I'm on sitting on the ground. <laughs> what happened? He said, you didn't duck. <laughs> they always ask that, how did you start your career? He says, well, uh, dad, which is his father, would take the boys in the backfield and he gets us fighting. The first one that had uh, drew, drew blood, Got the nickel. The rest had, and Dad said, how many times he went up the stairs crying because he never had any nickel. Like, he would always be the loser. So. Why the reputation as a, as a brawler? Initially, Yvonne hadn't had any proper training, so he, uh, he had some flaws as a boxer at, at the start, so he learned in the, to the, the school of hard knocks. He started with nothing, not even a, a, a punching bag. It was a, probably a, yeah, a bag with sand. How far would he have gone if he'd have trained? He told me one day, he said, you know, I would have gone far if I ever wanted to train. He said, but I didn't want to train, and I was too goddamn lonesome. That's, that's why he wasn't as good as he was, because he was just too lonesome to, just like Mom said, go to Montreal and drive, drive home that night and go back to fight next day. He said he couldn't train because he was just too lonesome. I'll never forget, Dad had that big white convertible. Pierre, Dad's father, would be driving the car, would be going to the sergeant road, and Dad would be running. Bo and I would be in the back seat going, cool, Dad, cool, Dad, and Dad would be running, and he'd run so far, and Pear would throw him in the car, Mom would bring him home, he would bring him home, and he'd all be wrapped up in garbage bag because he had to sweat, so he had to lose so much weight. She'd wrap him up in the garbage bag and throw him on the couch, and he'd puke, and he'd sleep for hours, then he'd get up, and that was his way of training. That's all he knew. He had nobody to show him how to train. Yvonne had everything to be a world champion, everything, but one person you got to give credit. I don't think Yvonne wouldn't have went halfway with him for that beautiful one over there. That's really. Right. Yeah. 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 Take us back to when you first met Yvonne in Bay St. Anne. I always had like a, a, a crush on him. One night we were sitting at the canteen and uh, I had a friend named Denise. I said, you know, I'm thinking of a boy. And she said, yeah, who is it? I kind of stopped and the door opened behind 
And there I turned my head. When I turned my head, who came in? Yvonne. I think what made me fell in love with him more is when we walk home and we talk when we got to the road where I was supposed to go. And I said, well, I can't talk too long because I have to go in. My, probably my parents are in the window, my mother especially in the window, looking around to see where's Teresa tonight. So he, he gave me a hug and he gave me a kiss. And it was so funny. It was like somebody told me, this is your husband. You're, going to, you're getting married to him. At 17, 17 and a half, we got married. He really loved his family. Never touched one of his family or, or you know, talked bad to them or whatever. He respected his family and they respected him and me too. That's the kind of guy he was. First stop in Munkin is the press club to meet sports writer Eddie St. Pierre. Well, I started to cover Yvonne in the uh, mid 50s after I took over the position of sports editor of the paper. As it turned out, we became very close friends. He was an uh, amazing personality in many ways. You know, for a guy that came from a small place like Bay St. Anne, uh, he was. Uh, probably one of the greatest fighters, in, definitely in Canada, and maybe even the world, at his division, the light heavyweight division. The big fight that really spurred Yvonne into the international uh, limelight was uh, 1957 in June when he held Tony Anthony to a draw in Detroit. Anthony kicked a hard left hook to the jaw thrown by Durrell. Durrell, a very tough customer, the underdog in this fight. Anthony's right goes to the body, puts a hard left hook high on the head. Durrell is in with a light jab on the chin. Durrell faints the left hand. Anthony just stands there. Durrell, a real tough customer, believe me, a capable opponent. Durrell takes a light jab. And then from there on, it set the stage for his famous battles with Archie Moore. Around the corner from the press club is the Musée Acadien, where Yvonne stands beside all Acadian heroes. Hey, Robert. Hi. How are you? Good. Brent Mason. Welcome to the museum, Robert. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yes. Beautiful day, huh? Yeah, beautiful. So we're going to learn about Yvonne Durrell? Exactly. All Come right. on in. Okay, thanks. Let's do it. As we stroll through Acadian history here, or at least a representation of it, could you talk a little bit about Yvonne and his place in terms of how the people see him? Yeah, Yvonne, uh, for his era, he was the greatest uh, Acadian hero in modern times. It was close to the people, basically, yeah. Okay. Why, why would that be? Like, how, why would they identify with him the way they did? He was, you know, in a sport that a lot of people love, you know, in the communities. Boxing was very popular in the time. Uh, people listening to the, to the radio, you know, boxing on radio, it's on the stage, from Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, a man from Bicenton is fighting the, the world. A great Acadian hero who always came home, no matter if he's fighting in New York. Or exactly. Where, yeah. where, where do you fight? New York? Where else? Detroit? Detroit, uh, London, England, Bermuda, Berlin, for example. Twice, no uh, from 54 to 56. Yeah. And then he comes back to Bicenton. He comes back to Bicenton. And he trains in Moncton, yes, but he comes back to Bicenton. You know, yeah. see his family, see his wife and see the people. Evangeline is a myth, you know, from Longfellow, but, you know, Yvonne Durrell is a reality. He, he's a real person, and he's the greatest hero for the Acadians. Here, I'll show you uh, some examples here? of your Yvonne Durrell's archives. These archives? Are, yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. Look at this stuff. And there's all sorts of artifacts, got newspapers, amazing. clippings, and magazines. I got tons of magazines. I can't believe what you've done here. What's this? This is the first round of Yvonne Durrell and Archie Moore. Some of these are the films that I, that I purchased off the, uh, uh, the web. And there are 60 million films of uh, Yvonne's fight against Archie Moore. Later rated as the most exciting fight of the year. Montreal, 10th of December, 1958. I was sitting there, and when the fight started, I went like this with my fur coat and I hid. Durrell would have to uh, come storming in at Archie Moore early in the fight if he were to uh, get him, and he just did with a right hand of the jaw. Five. He's down, he's down. 
I said, he's down. Who's down? She said, Archie Moore. I said, what? Nobody believed that a little French guy from New Brunswick was going to put the great Archie Moore on his back. It happened so quick. Well, I almost jumped in the ring, you know, <laughs> to be part of the, the congratulation, you know. Staggering about the ring. Up at the count of two, there is no mandatory eight count. There is no automatic three knockdown. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He's up at the count of nine. There's the bell. Archie Moore has made it. His handlers flew across the ring to get him back to that corner, and this is a big minute in Archie Moore's life. And then he knocked him down in the uh, fifth round. I think it was five or six count. The tide changed after that. Ten seconds left. Down goes Durrell. Two, three, four. And after a while, I knew that he was, uh, you know, he was losing the fight. And then I just covered my face. Saved by the bell at the count of eight. This is Durrell in his corner as he is down again in this fight. This must be the 11th round where he's on his... Uh, on his knees and hanging on to the, to the ropes. Yeah. Struggling at nine, ten, he is out. Man, oh man, what a dramatic turn in this fight. He was very disappointed. And in the dressing room afterwards, he felt he had let, let New Brunswick down, you know, but he, he tried the best he could. Should have been world champion, but he, it just wasn't meant to be. Yeah. As you know, they both became very close friends, eh? I was never hit so hard in all my life, although I fought men like Rocky Marciano and... Hi, Mom. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. What's going on? Um, you know, fighters, they've always got an excuse. They've always got an excuse for why they lost. You know, this or this or that. Of course, Dad had some reasons, but the main reason when he lost, it was always that I lost to a better man. That's it. I did the best I could. I lost to a better man. I, I, I was beat. And that's it. It's nice and easy. Circle around, Marcel. You move it to your right. Once you've delivered your punches, the hands are up, you move it to the right. Be careful not to hit your shoulders or your heads together, boys. Hey, how are you? Hey, good. How's it going? Good, yeah. Nice see you. Good work, guys. For us, well, Ivan Ra was like a hero. He proved to the world that he was, you know, he, you could do it if you got, you know, the guts to never quit. In the ring, he, he was as tough as they come. And like I said the other day, he should have been the real Rocky because he really lived it. But outside the ring, he was as passive and a gentle man. And his nickname was Dude, that means, in, in French, that means softy, you know? And he was a softy, and he was a spoiled brat. But Yvonne, <laughs> don't get mad at me, but... <laughs> Actually, we got Irish, uh, Bruce, my, my dad, it was all the... Uh, I first began work in this corner with some other fellas uh, around 1953. Out of 17 times that I worked this corner, he came out the winner 16 times. But were you in Montreal December 10th, No, I wasn't. No? And okay. I always, I have always thought, without boasting at all, that if I had been there, he would have won that championship. Because that's, what, that's what, where the mistake was made in the corner. After that first round, they said, take it easy, take your time, just lots of time. No such a thing as lots of time against a man like Moore. He might have lost that, that, that uh, bout, but he, he really won the, the, the fight because he got all the crowd, everybody was, you know, so enthusiastic, you know, for him and everything. I mean, he got the population, everybody on his side. And he took, you know, that little town of Bay Sinan, New Brunswick, he put it on the map. Oh, the... <laughs> How are you doing? I'm JJ. Potential here? No way, that's awesome. No one's wow. No one's even looking.
That's right. Hi. Nice Hi. to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> what was your dad like when you were young? What do you remember of that? I remember when I was little, uh, we had a TV home and everybody would be coming to watch the fight at home because they didn't have a TV. And mom would say, me and Yvonne Jr., mom would be saying, okay, go on, go upstairs, go on. She didn't want us to watch the fight because she didn't want us to see dad being hit. And we'd be sneaking down the stairs and and, she'd, and we'd hear mom cry or and say, oh my God. And then she'd, then she'd turn around and, mom, what's happening to dad? And she'd say, get upstairs, tell you to go upstairs. We'd always sneak up the stairs. But then once I got old enough that when he, he stopped boxing and then he was wrestling, I didn't want him to go wrestle away by himself. So I would always get off school at 3.30, get in the car with him. We'd go to Shila, we'd go to Chakadi, we'd come to Moncton, Shidiac, and I'd go with him because I didn't want him to fall asleep when because I, I knew he was boxing, wrestling rather. And uh, I'd get home, go to school, make do my homework either on the way there or while he was wrestling, I'd be sitting there and then we'd be going to, uh, then after that we'd be coming home and we're going back to school in the same routine and I did that for 20 years. What year did the Fisherman's Club open, do you remember? It was open for three years when the incident happened. The incident happened the night Yvonne shot a man in self-defense at the Fisherman's Club. Here in Fredericton to meet with Frank McKenna, the former Premier of New Brunswick, former Canadian ambassador, a very busy man on about 600,000 boards of directors, but he's meeting with us because Yvonne Durrell matters to him. Everybody admired and loved Yvonne Durrell and the Miramichi. Uh, they were the ones who recommended that he call me when he was in trouble. And high-profile lawyers from all around Canada offered their services. They flew in. I mean, they just arrived and said, look, we'll defend Yvonne Durrell. And, uh, and he was steadfast in saying, no, I, you know, people tell me that McKenna can do the job. And so much to my amazement, he stuck with me. <laughs> there was this gentleman, uh, Poirier, who had, been, uh, who, who had been really harassing Yvonne and was aggressive uh, with his car trying to run Yvonne over that night. And Yvonne, uh, who was really a victim too, in that he, he would genuinely felt that he was under, under threat from somebody who had a, a bit of a bad record. And uh, the Pori family were well liked and respected in Bay St. Anne, the Drell family. So it was a tragedy for the community and for the two people involved. But it re really was not a crime, in my view. The jury found that, in my view, it was not a crime. Uh, Yvonne did what he felt he had to do to defend himself and his family and uh, the other patrons of his club. After the incident, Yvonne closed the club. In 1994, he and Therese opened a small museum to showcase his boxing career. Yvonne was out of the limelight, but still an Acadian hero. Then, health problems. It was a hard, hard end because what he had, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like anybody to have it because he had Parkinson and dementia. And like we used to go to the dance, we used to go and at the end there, he couldn't even lift his feet to dance. And I would say, well, Yvonne, are you dancing tonight, or aren't you? Because, you know, you, I noticed, there was things that I noticed slowly dying on him. And to me, I couldn't accept it. At Yvonne's funeral, Frank McKenna introduced us to a gentleman from Toronto. Originally from the East Coast, his father had been a boxer and Yvonne knew him. There's a senior banker in our bank who, when they heard of his death, told me he wanted to go to the funeral. And I said, why would you want to go to the funeral? He said, because I was born in Bathurst, New Brunswick. My father was a boxer. And before I was even born, my father was killed in an airplane crash. Yvonne Durrell heard of it, came up, and did a benefit for me, and put enough money away for me to end up going to college. And that allowed me to go on later to play professional football and to become a, one of the senior bankers in Canada. He said, I'll never, ever forget uh, what he did for me and my family.
Darrell faints the left hand. Anthony comes in with a left foot to the head, pounds the right to the body, and takes a short right to the jaw by Darrell. Darrell is in with a hard left foot to the chin. He takes one on the jaw by Anthony. A good counter punch. Anthony's in with a jab on the chin. Anthony faints the left hand, comes in with another left hook, and another left hook, and another left hook on the jaw thrown by Anthony. That last was a corker. There's a light jab on the chin, two more on the nose by Anthony. He moves that left hand around and pounds the right hand to the body. And then Darrell, turning southpaw, puts the right on the left to the head and bothers Anthony. The crowd is in a bedlam at the moment now. He should have been the real Rocky, because he really lived it. When he died, I was next to him at the hospital. And he had, like, his eyes were a little bit open. And I never, never thought in my life that I would do that. And I just went there, and I just closed his eyes. It was like, all of a sudden, something was just, like, blank. And it... From then, then on, it was like, I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it that finally he was gone. And, I, you know, it was, to me, it was unbelievable. Dad always told me, he said, Paul, and how many times did he tell me that? Him and I, just him and I going somewhere, driving around, he'd say, Paul, you know what? I'll never be forgotten. You mark my word. People will always remember me. He was my dad. Loved him. If we'd filmed this in July, you'd be able to see Yvonne's headstone. But this is March, and it is New Brunswick. So there you have it. Yvonne Durrell went from the tiny community of Bay St. Anne to the world stage, became a hero to Canadians, a hero to the Acadian people, uh, but as important to him and I think to the people who knew him, he's a hero to his family and his friends, and uh, that's really his legacy. At the funeral parlor on a Monday night, a crowd had gathered to see the sight of a man in a casket made of satin and lace with rouge on his cheeks and sleep on his face. The funeral director had done a good job. The brass was polished on a hip knob. Candles and the mirrors that hung around the room lit up the corners and chased back the gloom. Death is a way of life, my friend. It ain't 